Okay, welcome everyone um, to our webinar today with Dr. Wendy Gifford. So she's going to be presenting, as you can see, on community-led knowledge translation, experiences translating knowledge with Indigenous communities. So once the presentation has concluded, um, we'll start the Q&A session. Um, I will be taking those via the chat box. So any questions you have, please send via the chat box. You don't have to wait until the Q&A to send them in. You can send them in advance if you want, um, and then we'll respond to them during the Q&A part of the webinar. Um, everyone has been muted except for the presenter. Um, all right, so I'm going to introduce our presenter now. So Dr. Wendy Gifford is an associate professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences School of Nursing at the University of Ottawa and Lawyer De Silva Research Chair in Community and Public Health Nursing. Her program of research focuses on knowledge translation with healthcare providers with a specific focus on translating knowledge with Indigenous communities to improve healthcare delivery and outcomes for Indigenous peoples. Dr. Gifford has received funding from the CIHR, Ministry of Ontario and Canadian Cancer Society in partnership with Indigenous communities. Prior to academia, she lived and worked as an outpost nurse in First Nations communities in Canada's north. So welcome, Dr. Gifford. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for being here with me. Um, and there we go. So before I get started, um, I would like to give a territorial acknowledgement, and I am currently situated in Ottawa, Ontario, and I would like to acknowledge the territory that I'm in, which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin First Nations. I am a second generation descendant of Hungarian and German immigrants, and um, I want to acknowledge this territory, and I thank you all for being here from wherever you are. Now, there's some people from all over the country, I, I think. So I would also like to acknowledge um, the communities that I partner with and I work with and the partners in the work I'm going to talk about today. Um, I work in partnership and at the direction of the Mohawk First Nations Health Center in Aquasasini and also the Algonquin Pequot um here in Ontario. And I would like to acknowledge the time, dedication, and knowledge that has been shared with me and that is embedded in this presentation. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, some of the funding that I've received that you'll see there. And to recognize the photos that I've used within this presentation, they've all been, um, they've all been used with permission from the people who have taken them, um, which are my community collaborators. And there's also a very, very interesting photo that I've included that's depicting Inuit stories um, and it's actually sorry someone um, I'm not sure what that is I'll, oh I see it here okay um, so some of the photos are taken from a sculpture that's in the Ottawa hospital um, entrance and it's it's a Inuit sculpture that is, uh, it, it actually is depicting a quadjack, which is covered in glass panels, and it's depicting the story of For Our Future, it's called, and uh, courtesy of Tung Savingat Inuit, and uh, it's, it's really worth seeing. It's a beautiful piece of art. So I have pictures embedded within this presentation of that as well. Sorry. Okay, my mouse is a little bit skittish here. So before we get started, I just wanted to talk about what Indigenous health research is. And this I'm um, pulling from CIHR's Institute of Indigenous Peoples Health, which was updated in 2019. And this definition says that it's research in any field or discipline that is related to the health and our wellness that is conducted by, grounded in, or engaged with First Nations, Inuit, or Métis communities, societies, or individuals, and their wisdom, cultures, experiences, or knowledge systems. 
It embraces the intellectual, physical, emotional, and or spiritual dimensions of knowledge. And it honors culture, language, history, and traditions. Um, it certainly involves indigenous approaches to study designs in a coordinated effort of partners in rural, remote, and urban communities. Um, whether, so whether the researchers are indigenous or non-indigenous, part of doing research, indigenous health research, is the commitment and respect for relationships held with indigenous communities. So the objectives of this presentation are to really just review some of the um, why, some of the reasons why disparities in health exist for First Nations Inuit and Métis people in Canada. Um, what Dr. Kerry Barasa has referred to as the root cause of illness. And uh, Dr. Barasa is the scientific director of the um, CIHR's Institute of Indigenous People's Health. And then to understand the resilience of Indigenous people and why knowledge translation is distinct. And then discuss some of the processes of translating knowledge with First Nations communities that have come out of the research that I've been doing with my partners. Um, and I would just like to also make a note that the term Indigenous which refers to the original inhabitants of a country regardless of borders. Within our Canadian context, that refers to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And I will use the term Indigenous when speaking collectively. Otherwise, I will refer specifically to the nation, community, or peoples that I'm referring to. So just some background. The United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People recognizes that Indigenous people have the rights to maintain and develop their traditional knowledge, medicines, and cultural expressions, have access to social and health services, and be actively involved in developing and determining health and social programs and their governance. So in Canada, beginning in 1871, First Nations people signed treaties with European settlers, and these were formal agreements to encourage, encourage peaceful relationships. And they specified promises, obligations, and benefits for both parties. So con they constitutionally recognize rights to ways of life for Indigenous people. For First Nations, this treaty started with First Nations, and that was to protect and use land to maintain their ways of life and livelihood, and to provide for families and communities. But colonial practices and government policies have had a troubling and tragic impact on Indigenous people's health and well-being. And this has been certainly shown in the deficit-focused research that we've, we've read about all the time. Um, but in 2012, the Health Council of Canada published a report called Empathy, Dignity, and Respect, Creating Cultural Safety for Aboriginal People in Healthcare. And it really highlighted from their broad um, interviews um, with Indigenous people across the country that Indigenous people, many, do not trust and therefore don't use mainstream health care services. They don't feel safe from stereotyping and racism. And ra Western approaches to health and health care are alienating and intimidating. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada Call to Action specifies and acknowledges, specifies to acknowledge that the current state of Aboriginal health in Canada is a direct result of previous Canadian government policies, including residential schools, and to recognize the need to implement health care rights of Indigenous people. And this is the call to action number 18, and it also says it recognizes the value of Aboriginal healing practices and use them in the treatment of Aboriginal patients. Um, the call to action number 22. So we know that there's many disparities in health and Indigenous people carry an inordinate burden of health issues and they suffer some of the worst health of any group in Canada, well the worst health of any group in Canada. Um, and they experience the poorest living conditions, they have inequitable access to education, food, employment, and health care and health care services. Now, specifically focusing on cancer, which is where my research, the bulk of it, is, is centered, um, cancer amongst Indigenous 
people is increasing and the five-year survival rates are lower than the rest of the uh, Canadian population. For example, um, a report done by the Chiefs of Ontario um, in collaboration with Cancer Care Ontario and the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Studies, CAIHI, showed that colorectal cancer is being increasing by 6 to 7 percent for males and females, respectively, um, whereas it stayed the same or has decreased for non-First Nations, and that breast cancer in the non-Indigenous population has stabilized but increasing for First Nations people. So we can see this, this disparity and increasing cancer rates um, and lower survival for First Nations people. And so some of the factors that contribute to this inc the increasing cancer burden are the systemic racism, marginalization, and historical legacies and government policies that continue to perpetuate healthcare inequities. And these, in these result in late stage diagnosis of cancer, low rates of cancer screening, increased risk factors and increased mor uh, comorbidities, and a lack of culturally safe healthcare practices and supports. And so what um, has been reported is that Indigenous people feel that their values and practices are not typically reflected in the dominant models of health and healthcare. So that paints the negative picture, but the other side is that Indigenous people are resilient and they are the ones that are in the best position to guide researchers, health providers, and decision makers in their path to wellness. They can identify the priorities that truly reflect their community needs and they can co-develop the strengths and asset-based solutions to address those community needs that are their priorities. And they also can guide us as Western research on how to translate their knowledge into healthcare practices, programs, and policies. So that brings me to the study, um, first study I'm going to talk about, which is um, was a CHR funded study and it was done in partnership with the First Nations of Aquasasani, the Mohawk First Nations of Aquasasani. And the overall goal of this study was to improve cancer survivorship supports for nurse, First Nations people. And one of the objectives that we carved out of it was to understand the process of translating Mohawk First Nations knowledge, knowledge into cancer survivorship healthcare practices. So a little bit about the setting, the Mohawk Nations of Aquasasani Aquasasani are geographically straddled at the intersection of Canada and United States and the provincial boundaries, so that's New York and Ontario and the provincial boundaries of Ontario and Quebec. So it's, it's got a very interesting um, geographic location and it's on the both borders of the St. Lawrence River, one on Ontario and one side on Quebec. Um, most of the land sits within the Canadian boundaries and there's a population of about 12,000 people that live on reserve. So we conducted a community-based participatory research study. Um, first, we, we um, met and assembled a community advisory group of eight people and in the, our advisory group we had elders, traditional teachers, healthcare providers that included physicians and nurses, cancer survivors and caregivers to guide us on each stage of the research process. Um, we held 16 advisory group meetings over 14 months and these were all held in community. Um, and then we had two focus group meetings uh, at the end with community members and healthcare providers and that was 20, with 24 additional participants. Um, the meetings were audio recorded and transcribed and then we inductively analyzed them with advisory group members and community members for the themes that came out of the research. So just to um, comment a little bit more on that, the, um, the advisory group were included in all aspects of the analysis for this and, and we worked uh, in partnership. Um, so that the so that the results really clearly reflected the meanings and the interpretations from from the community. 
So basically there was four categories of the KT process that were um, identified and the, the team put them in these categories to sort of help frame the knowledge translation process. And that was how do we start, how do we lead, and how do we succeed, and then what we need. So the first three are the process of knowledge translation, and the fourth is the knowledge translation resources or the evidence that is to be um, translated into practice. So I'm going to talk about um, the first three. Oops, I keep going the wrong way on my mouse. Okay, so how we start um, in really set the foundations for researchers working together with community. And the main concepts that came out of that were shared ownership, continued open consent, respectful communications, building relationships in the community, and managing expectations. So. Um, how we start, which again is the foundations for working together, um, the shared ownership and continued open consent really centered around this idea that trust takes time and it needs to be built and rebuilt and revisited at every encounter, every visit, um, because there is this long history of research being conducted on Indigenous people and and uh, without real true consent. Um, and so a quote from um, one of our, uh, from our data, uh, I think exemplifies this well. So I have quotes to, to really highlight what each of these concepts um, are talking about. So it says, we already have this cold 500 year history that carries with us today. So when we start up talking about the trust, that's what comes with it that history and how things have been taken in a really innocent kind of manner. I don't know how you diminish our history. I wish we could. So along with um, starting is this idea of respectful communications, which is about having a voice and sharing stories. Because communication um, for in this community is all around sharing your stories um, and everybody having a voice together. And part of sharing your stories is sharing who you are personally. Um, so another quote says, working together involves knowing each other as people and getting to know the person first before you start doing the work together, including who your family are, where your people have come from, and who you are beyond, beyond your work of research. So that's really a fundamental aspect of doing this work together and then translating knowledge. Building interactive relationships in the community really involved having a regular presence over time. And uh, table talks and community walks. So it's, it's really about your, your presence and your actions and your activities. Um, so it's about relationships at the and the kitchen table. You had to sit down at the table, have some coffee, eat something. That's a ceremony. That's what we do, and so it works. And that's what we've been doing forever. Um, and I, you know, hearing this, it makes me reflect back on my personal um, practice as an outpost nurse um, in remote communities. And certainly, to to start working together, I always, I, I frequently was invited into the into the home to get to know people before I could get it whatever the, um, the, the medical task was that I was there to do, be it something to do with diabetes or wound care or, or whatever. But um, it, was, it, was, it was just a, it was really made it very meaningful. Um, so another piece of working together is managing expectations. And this, I thought, was so poignantly identified, and that's for us as outsider researchers, Western researchers, not to take the lack of trust personally. Um, and so they said outsiders think like, oh, we don't like them, and that's why we're not trusting them, right? It's got nothing to do with that. It's this history that we have and the history that's being proven over and over and over again. 
So how we lead, these were sort of the guiding principles of translating knowledge. Um, and it involved these concepts, offering a safe and supportive path, integrating traditional and Western knowledge, pre pre preserving traditional ways of teaching, which also includes safeguarding traditional knowledge, and bringing minds together as an egalitarian team with through oral traditions. So again, to um, give some reference for each of these. So offering a safe, safe and hopeful and supportive path really is, was a way of focusing on the positive asset-focused research um, and uh, not just focusing on the negative. And that, that came out over and over again that people, people really want to work together to make a positive difference, not to be focusing on the health disparities uh, again and again. So they say, we're talking about how we get our people to see all different parts that we can offer them, which is you guys, Western researchers, and me and others, the community members, get them into a safe, supportive path through the cancer experience, have an opportunity to talk together so we can all figure out a path. And the path is a positive path forward. Um, and then integrating traditional and Western knowledge, this is a concept um, the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia have identified this idea of two-eyed seeing, which is bringing together seeing the world through two eyes, traditional and Western ways. And this came out again um, with, with this community. Um, there's not enough attention paid to our culture as protective, preventative, and curative. When we talk about chemo and radiation surgery, that's, that's just the physical part of it. All this other part is, I think, more important, referring to the psychosocial, emotional, and spiritual parts of healing. So that's part of the um, integrating the traditional ways. Whoops. Um, so preserving traditional ways and safeguarding traditional knowledge. Um, this, this concept really identified this tension between integrating traditional knowledge and safeguarding it. Um, and again, it relates back to the history of so much knowledge being expropriated and taken. And so really the, the messages to the, the community will provide the direction to the researchers on what is appropriate and what isn't. So here, um, a participant said, we're very, very safeguarded on our knowledge. There have been many angles the last 20 years of how to get that knowledge from us. And so when you start talking about trust, that's what you're really dealing with. And so it's, again, this, this history, this legacy of research being done in very, very um, exploitive ways. Um, and then when you're talking about leading in these knowledge translation um, teams, um, it's a very shared and democratic voice with consensus-based principles um, of working together. And um, they, that was termed bringing the minds together as an egalitarian team. So a participant said, if there is something that someone says that I can take, then I take it and I borrow that from her or vice versa and it goes around the table like that because there's not one person that, that's a leader of all of this. And so that's the way we adhere to our, to our traditional way of life. And then embedded in all of this is oral traditions. And that was called one of the deepest and strongest ways of life. Um, there's a reason why our ancestors said everything is done orally, because when we start writing things down, it starts to become law, the way it's got to be. And that goes entirely against our way of life, because they say that not one person has that the right way. So the oral tradition, and again, looking at the trust, um, if we all start writing everything down, as we do as researchers, we're collecting data, we're doing, it's, it, it immediately um, evokes a lot of um, feelings of distrust and uh, um, skepticism for people. So how we succeed, the major challenges to address is really 
um, was identified to start the healing process with people who fear asking for help and living with trauma, and to use sustainable actions that actually address community needs and community capacity. Um, so people who distrust the healthcare and traditional healing, um, really starting the processes there is, it's a very delicate and sensitive area, but it's important. Um, and it's important to start it and recognize that people are living with trauma. Um, and so people said that uh, I can't trust. People were very clear that they couldn't trust Western medicine. So they can do amazing things in repairing the body, but there's no focus on the real basis of healing. Um, and again, another quote which highlights this is our people are afraid of going to hospital. Hospital is a bad word because that's where you go to die in our language. And that's the main reason that we use traditional medicines. Um, so so there, this really this lack of trust, which is so foundational, you need to, when you're starting to work together, it's starting with people and recognizing from the beginning that people are living with trauma and people have this um, it's embedded. And then lastly, how we succeed is using sustainable actions that address community needs. And really this was about integrating what the research is about with other community priorities because the communities identify their priorities. They know what is important to them. They know their communities and what the issues are in their communities and how to fix them. So it's really about working with them around their priorities and building their capacity um, to do this. Uh, we have to, and a quote again, we have to figure out how to effect, efficiently do this to make it one of the many priorities. And you actually need a community champion. That's why we don't get the uptake that we expect when we're doing, uh, we're going to get with research. So it's very much about living together. So this is a um, pictorial of all of the themes that the community put together to um, really to take back and show them. Again, it's using art and nature as a way to give the messages. And the, th the themes that I've talked about are all embedded in here, and I won't go through that again, but just to show you um, what it looks like. So I'm just going to really quickly now talk about a KT study that um, we're doing with uh, Pequotnagon First Nations, which is an Algonquin community here in Ontario. And it's actually working on building culturally safe cancer survivorship care. And the purpose of this study, um, which was funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, was to explore culturally safe healthcare practices that support cancer survivorship healing in the Pequotnagon First Nations community. Um, and so, so this study that I'll talk about, we, we are now have another CIHR funded study to uh, take the findings from that and um, field test them with the community, develop resources and evaluate them in the community. So for this piece of it, we did a journey mapping um, process, which involved two focus groups. Uh, the first one was cancer survivors and family members and the second focus group with healthcare providers. And that was really to conceptualize what culturally safe cancer survivorship care looks like and the barriers and supports to receiving it. And after the journey mapping focus groups, we did semi-structured interviews with 13 further par participants. Actually, some of the participants were at the fo focus groups so that they could further explore their patient journeys and um, go into more detail and depth to identify criteria for culturally safe care. And so the results of this study um, that the community found was that culturally safe care really involves a broad definition of family. Family isn't defined or thought of as the nuclear family that often the, our, a European 
um, Western way of thinking about family. It's, it's much broader and it can involve community members that may or may not be blood related. Um, and so that, and that can all be considered immediate family. Um, also, the need for care for the caregivers, because the community is so tightly integrated together that the people in the community are caregiving, or the informal caregivers looking after people with cancer. Um, and so they also uh, have care. And that there's um, the idea of trauma-informed bereavement, which really stems from the really that the cancer can trigger trauma in so many community members and trauma again from this legacy of, um, of historical trauma. Uh, it, many people can be triggered from one family member being sick and that can be from being taken away and out of the community or for care not being provided. So really this, the idea of trauma-informed bereavement is central to cancer survivorship care. Um, and that also culture is a form of healing. And that was a really strong theme that um, people's cultural practices and beliefs and values towards health and healthcare are central to uh, healing, healing when they have cancer. And then um, the final piece was that stories are the cultural teachings and the basis for culturally safe care. And so the barriers to receiving culturally safe care uh, were that really there was very little reciprocal services and supports between communities and hospitals to support this um, culturally safe care for the community. So, in conclusion, um, First Nations peoples are very resilient to the historical effects of colonization. And this is, this is a strong message that um, we, it is, I've seen and I've heard again and again from the communities that I work with. Um, ongoing colonial trauma and systemic racism reinforces the disparities in health, which we know, we know they exist. Um, priority, the priority is to engage at grassroots levels to, um, to ensure that the priorities in the communities are being addressed. So the priorities are actually coming from the communities. Um, and then taking a strength and asset-based based approach uh, to, to healing and to healthcare. Um, the, communities, the communities that I've been working with, they know what they need and they have the answers. I think that it's important that we as Western research, researchers really listen and learn from them because the wisdom and the knowledge is there. Um, so our pro process of KT was helpful and I know that a lot of communities are developing their own processes for KT. So this is just the process that we developed you know, with, um, with a, a few communities here in Ontario. But really, you know, the key pieces um, are that communities operate as a collective. They use oral traditions and stories. Um, and it's a long process to develop the relationships to do this work and to do any research. Um, but they'll tell us what they need. And also, when we're getting it Right or wrong? <laughs> so, uh, oops. So, thank you. That's um, that's the end of my presentation. I'm open, happy to have questions. Thank you, Dr. Gifford. So, we'll just give everybody a minute here to um, collect their thoughts. So, if you do have a question, you can send it via the chat box. You can send it either to everyone so everyone can see it. I think that's always helpful. Or if you would rather send it just to KT moderator, um, then it comes just to me. But I will read out the question either way. So we'll give people a minute here Megan, to... Uh, Megan, I can't see the questions, so yes, please read them. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> okay, so let's 
see, we've got a couple coming in here. So first question, uh, Wendy, can you comment on how this process differs or not from integrated knowledge translation as we understand it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really a, a very, very good question. Um, and, and I would say that uh, it does differ. The, the fundamental piece is the relationships and building the trust. Um, integrative knowledge translation um, is also working towards, I mean, often fundamentally it's working towards practice and policy change and taking evidence-based solutions and putting them into practice. Um, I think that another one of the differences is that the solutions that Indigenous communities see and maybe want to integrate don't necessarily come from the evidence-based Western literature. They would like to consider them, and that's part of this, you know, the two-eyed scene piece, is they, they would like to consider them, but there's so much knowledge that they have that has been that hasn't been incorporated into those Western ways. So, so it's a really, I think it's a really important uh, distinction because we, you know, the, the evidence-based practice literature has a lot of effective strategies for for health and health and healthcare, and and we know that, um, but they may not work. They may not work with communities. Um, in, within, with different indigenous communities. Uh, so, so I think that that's, that's a piece that has been um, really, you know, it, it's coming to light. And, I mean, it, it is coming forefront. A lot of people are doing some really great work. Um, a lot of the indigenous communities are doing really great work. And the communities I work with, they are very, very interested in the Western research knowledge. Um, but it's not seen as the only type of knowledge. So I think that that's, that's one piece. The, the, um, the relationship, the other piece is the, um, really the ownership and control over the, the data. Um, and I know with integrative knowledge translation, often the decision makers want to share ownership as well. So it, it could be similar, but this is a fundamental piece of doing knowledge translation with Indigenous people. And often there'll be um, sort of sort of agreements written up on how you're going to work together and how the knowledge is going to be shared and owned. Um, so so that is explicit. It's it's not done at the beginning of a research study and then you carry on, you revisit those that all the time because because it can change and trust trust can be a very um, precarious piece. So those are the, yeah. There there's others Sorry. too, but those I think are some of the um, some of the bigger pieces that I've experienced. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more, a uh, few more questions coming through here. So this one is from Angela. She says, thank you for the insightful talk. As you mentioned, engaging with and earning trust from Indigenous peoples can take time. How do you factor this into grant timelines and what are some best practices in your experience? Yeah, yeah, really good question and um, grant timelines. Mm. You have to write it into your proposals, and and I really like with CIHR you can write or you know that little piece that you have to write about what are some of the sort of unforeseen issues you're going to have in doing your research, and and you just write it in and ask for more time and ask for more money. Um, I think that some of the best practices are spending time in the community. You you really you, you can't. You can't do it from your university office. It's it's work that has to be you have to be engaging because as a researcher you're you're a person first. I mean the fact that you're a researcher is is kind of secondary. Um, if they don't know who you are, I mean they. I don't mean to. Um, people, communities, and community members 
Um, my experience is that they would like to know who you are, and when they do, they're, and, and the trust is starting to be established, there's so much knowledge to be shared, so, um, and, and so much, not only knowledge to be shared, but research to be done. The communities that I work are very, very keen on doing research, and they're also keen to do research with someone like me, you know, from a Western European uh, descent. So, um, but, but not without the trust and not when I'm sitting at my university office, you know, ivory towered, um, and they're in their community. So, so I would say that that's the fundamental piece is you have to be in the community. And so with funders, <laughs> thank goodness CIHR usually gives a little bit of grace time because you have to, it's like construction work, you know, double the time and quadruple the cost. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next question is from Carolyn. So she says, as a barrier, you mentioned reciprocal services between hospitals and communities. And would you be able to um, unpack a little bit about what you mean by reciprocal services? Yes, yes. And that's, um, that's predominantly what we're focusing on in our, um, in one of the studies that we're doing with the Algonquin Octagon. Um, and the reciprocal services really, it, it's about having that continuity between hospital and home and, um, and having a communication between the two that understands what's going on in the community and what's going on in the hospital. Um, and, and really, there's, there's a knowledge piece to that because it's, it's about knowing, but it's also about setting up an infrastructure that can accommodate so that when, when people in community can feel well supported and then they have to go travel because usually, um, well, the communities I'm working with to go to a hospital does mean traveling outside the community and often for a few hours. And in, in uh, Aquasophony, for example, you often have to cross the U.S.-Canadian border as well. So it gets really complicated really quickly. Um, and so it's, it's about really having services that um, can complement so that when you when you go into the community into the hospital um, there is a process that community and family members for example can do smudging um, smudging within the hospital and the Ottawa hospital now has a policy on on smudging and um, and and it can be done but it's it's a cert because it's something that First Nations people may want to do while they're in hospital, or family members may want to do, and it's it has you know huge therapeutic benefits. Um, so so being able to do that in community, but then in hospital, and then back in community. So so part of it is having the policies and the infrastructure available in the hospitals to actually support care that is um, culturally culturally safe and that people understand, the healthcare providers understand that that's that is part of that is part of the care is supporting that. So so that's that's part of it um, is the infrastructure, the understanding and setting up because this is where we found when we did the journey mapping is that People start on a healing journey and then they hit this blockade where it's like sort of waking up on another planet, right? Like it's nothing, everything is done differently. Um, so it's about understanding and supporting Indigenous people to practice their healing methods if, if they choose to. Um, and another piece to that um, and the reciprocal services is the Ottawa Hospital has set up what is called the window cash room and it's actually a support room for uh, Indigenous people 
with cancer. It's at the Cancer Center, and it's actually in a room for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people to go, and it's surrounded by, um, you know, artifacts, people paintings, art and other things that people can feel, um, feel that they're more embedded in their um, culture. So, and they can do smudging there, there's traditional medicines, and so, so that's, that's, that's part of it. I, I don't know if that really answered your question. <laughs> it sounded thorough to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple more here and more coming in. So next one is from Thomas. He says, thank you, the presentation was very interesting. Um, and he asks, do you mean that only researchers uh, with long-term relationships with indigenous communities would be successful? Mm. Well, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that, um, but I, I, I would, with the work that I have done, um, until you, without a relationship and trust in the community, you're, it's really, it's not research with the community. And, and, and again, knowledge translation, the pieces with knowledge translation are that um, you, you're doing this research with the community, not on the community or on or even for the community, it's, it's with, and that's part of the, um, you know, the path to um, self self determination. Um, so, so I wouldn't say that no, but but I would say that until you have the trust, and that can start in many different ways. I mean, you can, there could be researchers working with the community, and the community trusts them, and they're they're happy to be. Um, to be, you know, meet a new researcher and and uh, and they can, you know, tell right away if they want to work with them and 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 uh, so so I would say that yeah no I wouldn't say that the that is the case that new researchers can't but you I would say that you certainly can't without without the trust. And it does take time to get there. But Thank there's you. lots of people doing it. There's certainly lots of people doing it. So, um, you know, there, and there's lots of communities that are um, that are open to to working with uh, researchers, Western researchers. And there's lots of indigenous researchers doing this work as well. So, so there's sort of a great um, Cool to to start with. Thank you. Um, so this question, I think it kind of builds off of that in a way. Um, this is from Winnie. So she says, "Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. I would like to know how you initiate that first connection with the community. So do you connect through an indigenous partner or some kind of consulting uh, group or organization or?" Um, is there a recommended way, or what do you think? Yeah, that's really tough as well. Um, it, it's about, you know, there's that saying, it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of that, but you do start, I mean, we, I'm, I'm not from Ottawa, and the communities that I work with are now, um, they're not in Ottawa, but they're in the Ottawa, the Ontario area. They're, they're within a few hours of Ottawa. Um, so, you know, getting started, it, there's, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. And, um, it, but it, again, it takes, it takes being engaged with the community and starting, starting to, to talk to people and to have a, um, Connections and networking. So, so just to maybe and and connecting with other researchers that are that are working with community. Um, so yesterday we had a full day um, symposium that brought together um, indigenous uh, trainees, so uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows and researchers um, and community members with 
non-Indigenous trainees, researchers, uh, and I don't know if we had any community members there, but it was the whole purpose was to engage and share and network and connect. So that's another way is to, to start, you know, there's a lot of Indigenous research symposiums and, and it's going, it's, it's because you're not going to do research with Indigenous communities unless you establish this relationship. So you don't fly in and survey and fly out, right? It's, um, I mean, maybe you do in some circumstances, but <laughs> um, with the work that I do, you don't. So starting going to Indigenous conferences and seeing, talking to the people who are presenting, which will be Indigenous researchers and, and community members and and scholars and, and trainees is another really, I, I think that that's a really important way as well. Um, and reaching out, reaching out to different areas. Ottawa, University of Ottawa has an Indigenous Student Resource Centre with just a, a plethora of um, knowledge and grad students, you know, looking to work with researchers. And so, so there's there's lots of different ways, but I think you have to you have to um, you have to reach out and start to make the connections and make the relationships. Okay, so I don't see any more questions right now, but maybe we'll give it one more minute to, uh, just in case there's anyone else who wanted to ask something. I'm happy to uh, mm -hmm. on any of the previous questions, if any of the, I'll ask you them like. <laughs> um, okay, so another question. Did you face any challenges in honorarium? And this is actually, I can speak uh, from some experience with this too is that um, not all institutions have kind of caught up with, um, you know, how things are preferred to be done in regards to things like honorarium. So I'm curious to hear what you think about this too. Oh, oh yes, and absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, challenges with the REB. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's where the challenges are. and. And it's a really, really interesting question because there there seems to be a transition going on in the research ethics boards about understanding how to work with um, how do you, how research is being conducted with indigenous communities, um, and it it does start with um, you know a lot of first of all so so my experience with the University of Ottawa and this I've been doing research with Indigenous communities for quite a few years now. And so way back, you know, when we first started, my first REB was like years ago. Um, there was no way we were going to, you know, honoraria. I mean, it was just, con it, it was considered payment and coercion and all of these things. And they, they said, like, what are you talking about? But, but over time, they've come to understand and it, now my REB goes through like hot night through butter, like it's just really, really um, easy uh, because there, but there's been, it, it wasn't when we started, there was an educational process to get there. And the part of it is, is for the REB boards, you know, which have lawyers and you know, these people, and then they're protective, they, they're protecting the human, um, you know, protection of human rights and, and it's a really good thing, but there's also, um, the pieces that to understand that there are different ways of doing research. So, so we always have honoraria. We the CIHR also is is really great at at um, approving honoraria. Um, not a problem there at all. And I think that the Institute of Indigenous Peoples Health has has is, is really to, has a lot to do with that. But um, so. There, there is, you can get there if they understand why, because honoraria, you know, it's, it, it isn't a payment. Um, 
it's part of respect and it's part of a traditional way. So it's about, you know, for REB, you have to, you get that nice little, you know, paragraph that explains how and why, and, um, and, and maybe it needs um, an in-person uh, explanation or a telephone call because they look at it and go, no, no, you can't do this, but, but you actually can. And so I, I think that my experience has certainly been, um, it's been a process, but it's, it's in a great place now. Um, and I think that it's um, changing uh, for lots of people doing research with Indigenous communities. Um, there's, it's changed the REB's um, uh, approach towards it. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we have a question from Craig, sort of on a current events topic. Um, he's, he's asking, what are your thoughts on including KT, KT um, regarding Wet'suwet'en um, or others uh, community solidarity within an organization uh, with respect to building relationships with um, First Nations communities and grassroots organizing? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I quite, it, it's, it, the question is about KT, how do we, how do we incorporate and do KT? Um, yeah, thoughts on including KT regarding um, sort of community solidarity, um, building relationships, Grassroots organizing. I'm not sure if they could be related. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think that the the key thing is that the community will direct how they want the KT done. Because um, I mean, KT. I think that maybe that's referring to um, dissemination. You know, I mean, integrative knowledge translation is the whole research process. So that's another form of KT. Um, but on both of those aspects, uh, the community, I mean, there's lots of different ways that the communities might want to engage in, to disseminate, to involve um, grassroots groups into, um, into either messaging or even data collection. Um, so I think that, I mean, the grassroots, Organizations, the grassroots groups within community are a fundamental piece, and, and that they in engaging with them is critical to knowing how to not only do the research but disseminate the research. So, in um, in in Aquasosony, for example, we work with the um, cancer support group, which is the community, which is a little grassroots community of people with cancer and their caregivers, and, and we take a lot of direction from them. So I think it's really, really important um, because, you know, just like any, any KT piece or integrative KT piece, you don't want to just hear, and it's not the ways that the communities I work with would be um, communicating, but you don't want to just hear from sort of the administrators of the health center, right? You, and, and they don't want to just hear from themselves either. So there's all these people. That's why we had patients participating in our advisory group and their family members. And they're always at our research meetings. Um, so I think that people from those grassroots organizations to be part of the, if you're, a, if you're establishing an advisory group, it's very important, very important. Okay. Hope that Sorry. some of that. <laughs> yeah, that was a tricky one. Um, so thank you very much. We're just about at the end of our session here. So um, thank you so much for the presentation. I think that was really uh, valuable for, for everyone. We had a great turnout as well. Um, so, and thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, just a small reminder to fill out an evaluation if you can. Um, I'll be sending a link to the evaluation and everyone who um, received the email from me would have received the same link in that email as well for the online evaluation. Our next session will be on Thursday, March 12th, same time, 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern. 
with um, Angela Fong, and she's going to be talking about um, how she used the Agree To tool to create a recommendation guide to assist oncology care providers with physical activity counseling and referral for physical activity. So that'll be our next session. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Gifford. We really, really appreciate you spending time with us today. Well, thank you. It's just my, my pleasure. Um, and I'm happy to share the knowledge that I've developed with, um, with the communities. Thank you. Okay, have a wonderful day. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, bye-bye.